All right. So last week we uh, studied the Judge Deborah, and we looked at the situation with Deborah and kind of secondary, obviously, well, a key component of that, of that account is Barak and his actions in it. But we focused on Deborah uh, and the situation with Sisera and the enemies of Israel. Uh, of course, we, we read quite a bit of Judges chapter 4 and Judges chapter 5, and so we're not going to go back and read through that. Uh, but we did mention last week in preparation for Barak uh, that if you had the time to go back and read it yourself, to read it instead of reading it and looking at the actions of Deborah and her character, read it from the perspective of looking at uh, Barak. Uh, putting emphasis on what he says and on his actions that we're told about. Uh, so we're not going to go through, like I said, all of those uh, details again, but there is one particular reference to Barak in the New Testament we're going to spend a little bit of time in. So uh, as we mentioned on our notes, obviously Barak, he's just like Deborah, he's only mentioned a handful of times in the Bible. Three places for sure, Judges chapter 4, Judges chapter 5, and Hebrews chapter 11, and in verse 32. Um, there has been a suggestion of 1 Samuel chapter 12, where uh, Beden is mentioned there, um, as, and there's some translations that have it as possibly Barak, as a reference to Barak. Uh, and it is interesting that in 1 Samuel chapter 12, and I, I will read this because it, it is an interesting reference, it's going back and looking at Sisera, or, or at least referencing the events with Sisera, uh, we find in verse uh, verse 9, uh, how that they forgot the Lord their God. He sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them. Then they cried out, verse 10 of 1 Samuel 12, they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Now we but now deliver us from the hands of our enemies, and we will serve you. And then in verse 11, it says, The Lord sent Jerubel, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. Uh, there is another Bedan mentioned uh, in the Old Testament in a genealogy. It is not the same as Barak, certainly. Um, it is interesting that Jerubel and Jephthah, these are, are listed in a, a series of, obviously, the situation with the judges. Uh, so it is possible that this Beden here is another name for Barak. Uh, however, it seems as though, even though he mentions Sisera by name, and that, that kind of lends credence to the idea that Beden may be a reference or another name of Barak, uh, it is interesting that Jerubel and Jephthah, it's almost as if uh, Samuel's going in chronological order. And Jerubel, he's mentioned in Judges chapter 7. And then Jephthah is mentioned in Judges chapter 11. So, I mean, it, it is possible, but it's also almost like he's going in chronological order, and he may reference Sisera and all of these events as a kind of an aside, as he's describing the situation. But then mentioning the names may not have anything specific to do to uh, connection to the events that he has already described. It, it is possible, uh, but again... There's no reference to Beden also being known as Barak. Uh, but but that, that is a kind of a, a question mark on, on that one. Um, we noted that Barak also served kind of as a, as a general for Israel, in particular uh, for the, the, the troops or the, the drafted troops, the uh, men for Zebulun and Naphtali uh, in uh, fighting against Sisera and his army whether or not he had any background experience in, in the military or not. We're not told much about the background of Barak, but certainly in terms of, of, it would appear he was at least some sort of a leader or acknowledged individual of the tribe of Naphtali. Uh, he was from Kadesh and Naphtali. Uh, he, of course, kind of the background with Kadesh, Kadesh was a city of refuge. Uh, it, that's mentioned in Joshua chapter 20 and again in Joshua chapter 21. Uh, anyone who uh, uh, killed someone and their family was after them for vengeance, they could run to a city of refuge and stay there and be safe. And Kadesh was listed as a city of refuge. Um, whether or not that means Barak was descended from someone who had, you know, 
committed murder or something. That we're not told that specifically. Then, of course, the, the region of the tribe of Naphtali features in a prophecy that is mentioned even in the New Testament. That prophecy is in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 1, and that's fulfilled in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. It's kind of interesting because you talk about the tribes of Israel, and Naphtali is a very rare one. Okay? You don't really hear a lot about Naphtali. And uh, so it's kind of interesting that, you know, this is, the, this is the type of study, one of the types of studies in which the, the rare moment where it would be for us to actually kind of talk about Naphtali a little bit. Uh, so uh, Judges chapter 4, as we kind of talked about with regard to uh, Deborah, the same point, main point applies, and that is obedience uh, and faith lead to victory over Sisera. Uh, we see how he hears the word of the Lord in verse 8 of chapter 4. Uh, and of course, Deborah is it, Deborah's speaking the word of the Lord to Sisera. And he, he hears it and he obeys it uh, to go up against Sisera. And of course, as we read there in chapter 4 and in verse 14, Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And of course, verse 15 and 16, Sisera is handed into the hands of Israel. Judges chapter 5, we noted this song of praise that uh, Deborah and uh, Barak sing to God. Both Barak and Deborah are mentioned here. Of course, they kind of speak about themselves in the third person in, in this song. Of course, Barak is mentioned, uh, of course, Deborah is mentioned in verse 7. And then Barak is also mentioned here in verse, and Deborah mentioned in verse 12. Um, the son of Obinoam, uh, of course, it, it says, Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away. Uh, would seem to be a reference to those men of Sisera, perhaps, who were captured. Uh, because we're not told of any captives of Israel that, that Barak rescued or anything like that. It would seem to be captives of, of Sisera's army. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a kind of the whole chapter 5 is a, is a, is a song to God of, of praise. Uh, so we see that. So the, the passage I kind of want to focus on tonight is in Hebrews chapter 11. And this is the chapter, what we call the chapter of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 30. And of course, the Hebrew writer, as he's going through this process of of describing not only people of faith, but in many ways he's gone kind of almost chronologically described Abraham and Sarah, then he's gone to uh, Moses and then to David. And then, of course, verse 30, he says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, verse 31, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Of course, we talked about Rahab a couple of weeks ago. And then in verse 32, what of and what more shall I say? And of course, to go through every single individual who could make up this chapter of faith would take forever, and, and the Hebrew writer knows this. So he says, how many more do I need to reference? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of course uh, we will discuss Gideon later at some point in the next couple of weeks, of Barak, of course here's Barak being mentioned, Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of uh, fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Of course, that would be foreigners, strangers. Verse 35, women received their dead race to life again. And then, of course, midway through verse 35, in addition to all these inspiring and miraculous things, there's also some very serious uh, consequences as a result uh, for people of faith as well, being tortured, um, and then, of course, verse 36, having trials of mockings and scourgings, being stoned, being sawn in half, and so forth. So, Barak is mentioned in this list of individuals of which the Hebrew writer says, time would fail me to talk about all of these people in detail. Uh, and, of course, even this isn't a comprehensive list of people. But Barak is mentioned here in chapter 11 and in verse 32. So I want you to kind of keep that in your mind, and as we go through our questions, we're going to talk more about why he's included here in Hebrews chapter 11. 
So go into our questions. Of what tribe was Barak from? Naphtali. Yeah, Naphtali. And, and again, it, it's, it's uh, significant that we're told he's from Naphtali because other than Barak, there's really only one other individual of note in the entire Bible that we're told about of being from Naphtali. That's not to say other important people weren't from Naphtali and they're just not recorded, or people of faith for that matter. Uh, but in terms of what's recorded for us, the only other, I guess you could say, significant individual was Huram, who was the bronze maker for Solomon. Uh, and he did all of the bronze work for King Solomon. And he was from Naphtali. But as far as that goes, Barak is kind of the, the only other one. Uh, so that's kind of interesting uh, to me. That, that, you, know, you talk about Naphtali and Dan and some of these other tribes that there's not a lot said about them. You, you hear about them in the early goings of being the sons of Jacob, and then you go forward, and now all of a sudden they've turned into tribes. And after that, really the main focus is on Judah, Benjamin, okay? And then you've got the ten tribes of Israel in the, in the uh, north, so, uh, it's, or in the south. So it, it's, it's kind of a, a difficult uh, thing to to kind of look at and see, well, who, who all was from what tribe and, and so forth. Second question, why does Barak ask Deborah to go up with him, and does this suggest a lack of faith on his part? So remember, initially, back in Judges chapter 4, uh, when uh, Deborah tells uh, Barak of the commandment of the Lord, we see this in verse, uh, verse 6. Of Judges 4, she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor, take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. And of course, when she says, has not the Lord Israel, God of Israel, that's not to say that God had commanded it directly to Barak and Barak simply hadn't listened. Uh, this is just kind of a, we see this every now and then in the Old and New Testaments where this, this was the first time Barak was hearing this, but it was kind of a, this is a fact. The God, uh, Jehovah has spoken this, so you need to go and do this. And so as Deborah's telling uh, Barak, the word of the Lord here. And keep in mind, we talked about the weapons of warfare that Sisera and the army of, uh, that they have in Hazor, uh, the, the type of, of, of uh, weapons that they have to go up against. This was a very uh, formidable opponent. And then in verse 8, Barak says, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And of course, she says, surely I will go. So that being the case, when Barak makes this statement, if you will go with me, then fine, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Nolan? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Doug? Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, and of course, it shows that JL or that uh, uh, Deborah knew what was going to happen. That speaks to her ability as a prophetess that the Lord had revealed how this was going to, to go down. Uh, I think in some ways, whether or not it was a consequence, I don't know, but I know that Barak was okay with it. 
Okay, so I, I don't know, I don't think we see here that Barak was a glory seeker necessarily, or that he wanted all of the credit. He was okay with it. In fact, even in, in Judges chapter 5, J.L. is praised for her role. Uh, and of course, that's Deborah and Barak together singing this praise to God. Uh, so I, I think that when you, especially when you compare this with Hebrews 11, and this is kind of one of the reasons why we put the two together here, he's mentioned in the chapter faith. Okay, so it would be odd for the Hebrew writer to mention Barak if all we really have is an example of a lack of faith from Barak. And so I would suggest that, that first of all, why, why does he ask Deborah to go with him? And in addition to what Nolan said about, hey, you know, maybe he needs more information, uh, there's, you know, I, I want that person who represents the Lord in this situation to be there with me. And I think ultimately, as Nolan said, it kind of shows his faith. And I think it shows the assurance that she will provide him. The, the comfort of knowing that God's representative or God's mouthpiece, as the prophets were, is going to be with me in this event. Okay, and if, if something needs to be done and God says it needs to be done, I'll do it. You know, that way I'm not all by myself. And so in some ways it may speak to a, a somewhat of a human element in that, well, even though you can't see God, obviously God was going to be with Barak anyway, but having the prophetess there is, would be incredibly comforting and assure him that God is going to be there. And that would strengthen his conviction, strengthen his, his uh, desire to see it through. And so, I, like, like Nolan said, I don't think it shows a lack of faith. I, I think it simply shows a desire for assurance. Gideon is another example. Remember, we, eventually we'll talk about Gideon. You know, Gideon tested God like three times. Okay? Whether or not, you know, if, if you truly are Jehovah and you truly have the power to be able to to bring about deliverance for Israel, will you take, I forget exactly all the different elements, but the, the piece of wool and the dew being on it, and then the next morning the dew wasn't on it or something like that. And so those different elements goes to show assurance while Gideon is listed in the chapter of faith. So I wouldn't say it's a lack of faith. I think as human beings, we need reassurance. And I think in some ways that's what she provided. All right, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like having the Ark of the Covenant with the children of Israel when they would, went to battle. Even though God, it wasn't God, and it was never meant to represent God, it certainly did represent a uh, uh, presence for the children of Israel. Because God, at, you know, on the Days of Atonement, he, he would, on the Day of Atonement, he would sit on the mercy seat. You know, so that Ark of the Covenant came to kind of represent the fact that God was with Israel. Even the Philistines recognized that. That's why they took the Ark of the Covenant. And they, they, they uh, took it, remember, with the... Uh, that's, also, that's also why they got rid of it. That's right. Remember their Lord Dagon, their God Dagon? And they, they set the Ark of the Covenant before Dagon, and uh, they came back in, and his hands were cut off. And then at one point, I think his head was cut off. And so he had a lot of... A lot of weird events going on with that. Joe, do I see your hand? Hmm. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, of course, that, that's one of the points we talked about last week about Deborah was that this, this was something that she was convicted in. I mean, she, we see her faith in that the things that God told her to tell uh, Barak, she believed God would bring this about as he said he would. And so she went because she had no doubt that God was going to do it because God said he would. And so that kind of trickles down to Barak because Barak is judging her based on whether or not it's going to happen on being a, a true prophetess. And of course, there's some respect here, but as far as how much Barak knew, keep in mind, remember we looked at that map last week about uh, Ramah and where, you know, it was just north of Jerusalem a little bit from, uh, that's where uh, she sat under this tree to offer judgments to Israel. And of course, uh, we talk about uh, Kadesh and Naphtali, that's way up north 
uh, on the northern edge uh, of the kingdom. And so you talk about uh, kind of the distance and whether or not he, did he even know Deborah before this? Or did he know her, certainly did he know her personally? I don't know, we're not told. So imagine if you will, he didn't really know, if he didn't know Deborah, uh, maybe he just knew of her, okay? But if he didn't know Deborah personally, and she called for him from Kadesh, he comes and meets her in Rama, and she's like, okay, I want you to go up against Sisera. Okay, well, yeah, I'll do it if you'll go with me. Okay, so, yeah, I, I think it, it sh does not show a lack of faith. It shows the need for reassurance and, and, and the need to make sure that this woman is what she says she is, that she is indeed a prophetess and that she does indeed speak the word of the Lord. Yeah. Anything else? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it also goes to show that God, he doesn't have to use the mightiest and the strongest people to bring about his will, does he? Uh, eventually, when we we're going to talk about Samson at one point, too. And, and I am convinced, personally, that Samson was the scrawniest guy you've ever seen. Okay, I'm convinced that he's always depicted as this Arnold Schwarzenegger type of fella. But if, it were, if there were any, any suggestion that this man of his own strength was doing this, it kind of would go against the pattern that God had shown in using the weakest. I mean, Gideon of the smallest tribe, of the, of the smallest family of the tribe. And Samson, I, I, I just wonder if, you know, I mean, why did Bath, uh, Beth, not Bathsheba, uh, Delilah ask, where does your strength come from? If he looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, obviously you work out, you go to the gym, okay? But it would seem to suggest that this man didn't look like an individual who was capable of this type of stuff. I mean, it just goes to show that, I mean, we're not told Barak was the mightiest warrior in Israel, you know, and yet Barak, whatever background he had, God used him and JL for that matter, who aside from this account, we would never know J who JL was. And we know of her only because God utilized her in his plan. Yeah, great point. All right, third question. Why is Barak mentioned in Hebrews 11 among the judges while Deborah is not? And, and does this show, I guess you could add to this, does this show some sort of anti-woman mindset from the writer of Hebrews? There you go. He mentioned, he mentioned what woman the verse before? Rahab. And then who else had he mentioned before? What other woman? Sarah. Okay. And of course, he also mentioned the parents of Moses. So, I mean, this is not some, I'm leaving women out on purpose type of thing. So if that's the case, why is Barak mentioned, but Deborah's not? Yeah, absolutely. I think the pattern that you see from the Hebrew writer isn't just people who had faith. It was people who had faith and acted on it. In fact, that is the key component of Hebrews chapter 11. These are people who, because of their conviction, then went and did something they were told to do. Okay, it's not to say that, that uh, Deborah didn't have faith. She did. And it does, it's not to say that she didn't, it didn't require faith for her to listen to the Lord and go up with Barak. It did, but she was representative of the prophets. Barak, on the other hand, especially if we add in here the, the, the thought process, did he even know her before he ever met her in Judges chapter 4? You know, did he even know her? And especially if he didn't, then this speaks to the fact that he's not just going on God's word speaking directly to him. No, God's word has come to, to this woman, and now she's telling me that she's a prophetess and God has said to do this. Well, if you come with me, okay, and you are willing to put your life on the line, then I'll do it. 
Okay, because if that's truly what God wants me to do, I'm willing to do it, and I'll have faith that God will bring it about. And, and so, you know, like Snoop said, I think it, it goes back to this, these individuals led armies, these individuals did things based on the word of the Lord that may or may not have come directly to them, but it shows that they acted out of conviction that Jehovah would bring about what he says he'll bring about. Uh, and again, that's not to say that Deborah didn't have faith worthy of emulation. We talked about that last week. But I think in the context of the Hebrew writer in verse 32, Barak fits that bill along with Jephthah and Gideon and these others more so than Deborah would since he already talked about the prophets and she was a prophetess. Okay? So yeah, he acted out of faith, especially despite, I mean, he knew of, of all the people, he knew Sisera's army, he knew about the weapons of warfare that they had, and yet he still, by faith, went and did what God told him to do. Any questions through that point? All right, last question. What characteristics, oh, what characteristics of Barak are worthy of emulation? Obedience, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's exactly what Barak did. It wasn't obviously the gospel, but it's the same idea. Snoop? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Obedience, submission to the will of God and his role in it, as Nolan has mentioned, as several have mentioned, the fact that, first of all, Deborah is a prophetess, okay, and, and he didn't take issue with that. There wasn't like some anti-woman type of thing going on. The fact that J.L., he didn't, not only did he didn't not argue with Deborah here, but later on when he comes to the tent of J.L. and he sees that Sisera is dead, he, he doesn't make a, a big, why did, you, why did you kill him? I wanted to kill him. I, the glory was supposed to be mine and all that. He doesn't do that. Okay, he doesn't do that. Uh, and if anything, in Judges chapter 5, they praise Jael for her role in fulfilling God's plan. And so that plus, obviously, Judges chapter 5, acknowledging God's role, in the, uh, God's, God brought this victory about against Sisera and these who were oppressing the children of Israel. Uh, all of that goes together to show that there are characteristics here, much like Deborah, but the example, I guess, is emphasized with Barak because, as we've mentioned, he had to hear it from someone else and told what to do. This wasn't coming through inspiration of the Holy Spirit or something like that, like was happening with, with Deborah. And again, that doesn't speak any less to her faith. It just simply emphasizes Barak's faith in, therefore, doing what God commanded to do. All right. Anything else through Barak? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. Right. Right. Absolutely. You know, and there, there are, this is, and this, especially for, um, for, for preachers and elders, I think this is a, a very special point regarding glory or receiving credit. Um, I, I, I knew of a preacher one time, I don't even know if he's still preaching now, but years ago he said that his goal was to be a, quote, big name preacher. Okay, he wanted to go on the, the, the uh, gospel meeting circuit and all that stuff, and he wanted to be a big-name preacher. And, and I just, when I heard this was told to me, and I, I said, I, what, what's, the point? what's the point of that? You, you go where you're sent, you, you do what you're supposed to do. Being a big-name preacher isn't, isn't the goal. That's not what the point is. And to me, it kind of goes to show in situations for preachers and elders 
let God's will be done. This isn't about you. It's about God. Uh, and that's the main part, and I think that's what we see from Barrett. Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's exactly what God wants from his people. You know, people who will do what he tells them to do. Without pride, without a lack of humility, without grandstanding and seeking credit and glory, that it's about God. All right, everybody. Uh, I thought it was kind of a, a neat study uh, with Barak. Uh, next week, uh, the notes are on... I put the notes on the table. Yeah, put the notes on the table on Stephen. Uh, from Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. Snoop? Barak? It, you can pronounce it either way, but I, when I looked at it, um, the, uh, and I'll look at it and make sure, but when I looked at the pronunciation, it was just Barak. But, right. <laughs> Barak. Barak. Yeah, I... I, I I've always heard it Barrack, and when I looked at the pronunciation, it looked like it was Barrack. Uh, but it could go either way. Barrack. It could go that way, too. Yeah. A lot of these names, like Deborah instead of Deborah, you know, some of these names are, are kind of weird. All right, everybody. Thanks. Uh, and we'll, we'll start our, our service here in just a second.